Hello everybody, this is Michael Hollands once again for Sound of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to be joined by Emmy-winning composer Theodore Shapiro. Over the course of his career, he wrote the scores for projects such as The Devil Wears Prada, Heist, Tropic Thunder, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, St. Vincent, Along Came Polly, Starsky and Hutch, Trumbo, The Intern, The Ghostbusters Reboot, Severance, The School for Good and Evil, Wolves, and many more. It is my pleasure to welcome Theodore Shapiro. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you on my show. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedule. I really appreciate that. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Theodore, before we talk about more recent events and recent scores, mm -hmm. I would like to ask you about your past just a little bit and how you got involved in the game. As I understand, you earned both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in music and composition in mm -hmm. 1993 and 1995, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. And could you please tell me how you got started in this business and how you managed to navigate <laughs> through the first assignments. Yeah. Um, so when I um, I graduated from, from my undergraduate university in 93, and then I went, I moved to New York to start a master's program um, at Juilliard. And while I was at Juilliard, um, I had two friends from undergraduate um, who were starting in different endeavors in in media um i had one good friend who was starting um at at nyu film school um and then i had another good friend who was um he was part of a sketch comedy group that had a show on mtv and on the on so on one side my friend at nyu film school um I started doing his short films and then, you know, some of his friends and colleagues at, at NYU saw the, the work that I had done and liked it and, and started hiring me to do their short films. And that path grew until um, I, I did somebody's thesis film, a student thesis film, and that film went to the Sundance Film Festival that year. And it won a bunch of awards and that was like 1997 or something like that um and the the film was called hurricane streets and it didn't ultimately you know it made a big splash at the festival and then didn't ultimately make a big splash you know at the box office but but um you know but at that point i had a you know a real feature film under my belt and um and that was sort of the launching point for that. Um, and then, you know, on, on the TV side, um, they, I, there was this sketch comedy show on MTV called The State. And they had a composer, but that composer was in a band and the band went on tour, so they needed somebody else. And, um, and I volunteered to do it and and assured them that I was, you know, completely capable of 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 doing it when in fact I really didn't know what I was doing at all. Um but I started working on the show and um really learned a lot about how to score, you know, score a picture just by doing it. Um and uh you know that ultimately led to more opportunities in in tv over over the years um and just sort of helped me you know make some money while i was getting getting my career underway at what point did you feel you were really being put on the map as an artist as a composer as a musical storyteller you know i mean it's funny because in my um you know, in my perception of it, um, you know, everything was always just like a, you know, a little step forward and not like some huge giant leap. I think that one clear place that was helpful was, I mean, there, there was a period where I did, um, 
I did the movie Dodgeball and and that movie um was a you know a huge success financially and I think that there was some sense that the score had really helped the movie um you know I I don't think I did anything um I mean I'm proud of my work on it I don't think I did anything that a good film composer shouldn't do on it you know I you know I basically brought particularly the dodgeball scenes to life just by, by supporting the storytelling, um, you know, and, but, but, you know, there's a big leap between having a temp score and having, uh, you know, something really specifically composed to picture. And, and it did elevate the, those scenes a lot. And, um, and so anyway, th- th- that was, I, that was a big, um, that was a big deal. I think. I think that gained the trust of of Fox, um, the the studio, um, and that led to a lot of of subsequent work with Fox, and it helped me along in my career. And then, and then one of those next movies at Fox was The Devil Wears Prada, which which was, um, you know, that was a big deal as well, and um, and uh, an, another movie that it was is. It, both a box office success and a critically acclaimed movie that has stood stood the test of time. David Frankel directed on um, The Devil Wears yes. uh, Prada, and you've done a couple of movies with him: Hope Springs, Marley and Me, um, Collateral Beauty, also. And you've mm-hmm. had a couple of very fruitful um, collaborations throughout your career so far. Yeah. I mean, David Frankel being one of them, um, Jay Roach, and also you know. Yeah. Ben Stiller, um, what do you think is essential w- when it comes to a really good collaboration, you know, in terms of not just writing the music, but also focusing on communication? How does that usually yeah. work with you? And I know I've, ju- I've just mentioned a couple of directors, I mean, yeah. probably different personalities, but how would you verbalize that? Well, first of all, um, I work with really nice people. That's that that is um that is a blessing. Uh and and so you know, I mean it makes a big deal to 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 genuinely like the people that you work with. Um the I mean the business is very much about relationships. On a let's put it put aside the creative piece for a second just sustaining a career in film scoring is is really um is really founded on creative partnerships that that you return to um and where both you know where your um creative teamwork hopefully grows over the course of that over that relationship you i i think that um you know, in, in, in all of the cases of these directors that you've mentioned, you know, we just have a very good, um, we have a very good communication and all of these directors create um, a safe space to try and fail. You know, it, it, it's really, really important that you as a composer that you never feel like if I if I take a risk and I get it wrong that that this director is gonna you know think I'm terrible or or get worried that I'm that I'm missing the you know that I'm missing the tone of the movie you want you want a an environment where failure and risk taking is encouraged um, and I really do feel that way with 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 all of my director collaborations. You know, there there's a real willingness to um, to try things, and that that's where I think the best work comes from. Yeah, and thank you, Theodore. And I think it's so vital to know that it is okay to miss or to quote unquote screw up because that yeah. al- al- because that ultimately can lead to a better result and you need to find a common ground. I think the ver- the worst thing you can do is to give somebody the impression that if they fail, they might be out of a job. I think yeah. that, that is the worst thing you could do from my point of view. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think, um, 
I think that that is just creative death. Um, you know, you, you, you never want to be operating out of fear. Uh, and, you know, that only encourages you to, um, you know, to, to, uh, as, as we say, um, to aim the ball instead of throw the ball, you know, and, um, uh, I, I, I feel really lucky that I don't, that I am, don't get put in those situations. Thank God. I mean, it's the like, like you said, it's the uh, the kiss of death, or the um, let's say the, the worst case scenario. You know, to, yeah. to it, because it makes you feel they do not trust you ev eventually. But theater, I'm curious because you have tackled so many different films and genres and projects, and how time consuming or difficult would you say it has been to become a musical character actor if you will <laughs> um well you know th that is is really the joy of of my job is, is that um you know I, i'm not asked to do the same thing on every project i really have been lucky to work on a on a variety of of different things and um i haven't been pigeonholed as um you know, as one thing, I, as one thing or another, I've done a lot of comedies and, and it's been, you know, it's been some work to, um, you know, expand my, you know, expand my body of work beyond comedy. But, um, but I've been lucky to be able to do that. And, and so now I just sort of feel like every time I walk into a new project, um, you know, I, I feel like I have to, approach it you know i i love to do puzzles um that's one of my one of my pastimes that i enjoy i like to do crosswords and and all, all jigsaw puzzles all kinds of puzzles and i approach movies like they are puzzles you know i i walk into every project trying to think about how i can crack the code of of that particular movie um or tv show and you know that that code could be like a very unique sound or it could be a, a theme or it could be some sort of a conceptual framework. But, but in any case, um, you know, I, I, I do approach every project, like I'm going to find some new way in and, um, and that really makes the job interesting. And it also just helps me to, to, um, you know, come up with with new solutions and and find different pathways um, for my music, and that that's a that's a real uh, exciting part of my job. Great, and thank you for elaborating on that. And you're right; I mean, it's basically a puzzle, or let's say the equivalent of um, solving a a math equation, basically, yeah. or, or to a certain extent, and. You also, of course, have certain day-to-day -day tasks, obviously writing music, but it's much more, or there's more to it than, than meets the eye, because ultimately, considering the amount of people you work with and for, you need to also be a, a translator, if you will, for, for, mm -hmm. a, for a director or producer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you definitely are... First and foremost, you're part of a, um, you're part of a storytelling team. You know, it's, it's not it's not about me. It's it's really about um, how I can serve the the director um, and and the story that that they want to tell. And um, but that's that's a lovely thing. You know, I mean, these every every project is this huge huge multi-headed beast and um you know and I, I i love being being the head of one particular department and and getting to you know i i get to bounce off of the creative contributions that the cinematographer makes that the production designer makes you know obviously the actors and 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 the writing you know and um so i i I really enjoy the aspect of the job that is collaborative and um, and and 
you know, coexisting within within all these different creative contributions. I know, Theodore, that there are many people in this industry that seem to be working around the clock. And I do seem to recall, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you like to or tend to work from, let's say, 9 to 6 or 9 to 5.30. James Newton Howard would probably say banker's hours. <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> would you say that this basically um, requires to be an incredibly fast writer? How do you manage to work those hours and still to write or to finish all the cues on time and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting. Yeah. I have always pursued the, um, the James Newton Howard model and not the Hans model um, uh, in terms of my hours at the studio. And, you know, and that was important to me because I, you know, when I had kids, I, I wanted to, uh, spend time with them. And so, so leaving at five 30 allowed me to, to do that. Uh, you know, I just kept always thinking that there would be a point at, at which I'd need to abandon, I'd need to abandon that those hours and work longer hours. And I just really have never had to do it. You know, the, the, I've gotten more efficient with my writing. Um, <clears throat> and I, I just sort of keep finding that if if I write uh, two minutes of music every day, uh, eventually I'll like I'll finish the score and and generally, you know, not you know with with time to spare. And so, um, you know, I I, I have been uh, you know just, just fortunate to to be in that situation, and I'm fortunate that it's that has never gotten blown out of the water by a particular project. I just sort of keep on trudging along with two minutes a day or more um, if I'm lucky enough. And, and that seems to get the job done. Theodore, I would like to talk about um, Ben Stiller just briefly. I, I know we don't have that much time today, okay. but, but you, you have worked with him for a couple of years and You have done Tropic Thunder and Zoolander Part 2 and The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, which I think is his uh, most mature film as a filmmaker. I think that uh -huh. it, it's it's his best film as a director. And I just love the whole storytelling of it and the um, the gist of the of the film and what it really brings across to, to the audience. Mm -hmm. And how would you describe... Ben Stiller's approach to, to filmmaking and also to, as, let's say, his approach to music and how he communicates with you and how you how you managed to form this really successful team. Well, um, I mean, the first thing I'll say is just that, uh, I mean, I think Ben is a, a phenomenal director and he has incredible instincts about music. Um, and one thing I've learned over the years with him is, uh, what, you know, if he gives me a note, even if at first I think like, oh man, come on, this is working great. Um, I really trust his instincts. Yeah. You know, I've, I've learned over time to just think, you know, if he gives me a note, I think like he's probably right. Um, because I've just, I've just experienced it so many times. I mean, One thing, um, you know, when we did Tropic Thunder together, that was the first that was the first movie that we collaborated on as director and composer. He had produced several other things that I that I'd worked on. Um, <clears throat> you know, his um, his taste was very kind of maximalist early on. It was appropriately so for for Tropic Thunder and for Zoolander 2. Um you know so so everything was just kind of huge all the time and we were just throwing every you know you know a huge orchestra and a band with guitars and taiko drums and you know just a, just a massive massive sound um and then it you know it often felt like no matter how big it was you know he the note would be like could it get bigger you know and and i was like i don't know what else i can throw at this thing You know, I think that he has evolved so much as a filmmaker over time and, and you know, particularly on, um, you know, on Secret Life of Walter Mitty, um, 
you know, he, there was a real shift in, in his approach to music and, and he was, um, you know, he, he began to embrace a much more, um, you know, a, a, a much less maximalist approach and just something very sort of simple and beautiful. And, um, and that was a really, that was a really nice, you know, different mode to explore with him. Um, you know, and then I think that that's only continued with, um, with Severance where, where, you know, he really, I think was instrumental in, in us pursuing a very minimal approach, just, you know, almost the polar opposite where we're really reducing and reducing, um, but both in terms of instrumentation and in terms of the, the busyness of, of what's happening. There's just a lot of space. Um, and, uh, and that's been a really, I think, effective tone for, for the show. Yeah. And Severance, I must say, is a very good show. And as far as I know that season two has already been announced, I felt the cliffhanger of the show was really good. And the whole product shows, let's say, how um, mature Ben Stiller also has become as a director. He directed yeah. um, the majority of the episodes and you scored all the episodes and you won the Emmy to boot. And yeah. the main title was really, really good. I mean, not just in terms of the, um, the visuals and the images, but also in terms of the musical storytelling. Did they present you the main title and you scored it? Or did you score a piece of music and then they kind of, you know, used it to, to accompany the, the, the images? So um, the story with that is that I... I wrote this piece of music. Um, I, you know, I had been, I had been playing um, some ideas for Ben, uh, and and then and there was this little fragment of music um, that was in one of the pieces that I wrote that he that he seemed to respond to, and um, and the fragment in its original presentation was was very kind of electronic and um but I, I i noticed that he really responded to that section and so i thought i'm gonna do something i'm gonna see what else i can do with this with this chord progression and so i sat down and and played this chord progression at the piano and the and it was like a big light bulb moment um where it 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 became immediately clear that this could be this could be the tone of the show is just th this very kind of simple solo piano idea. And so I wrote like a two and a half minute piece um, based on that. And he uh, eventually wrote or called me and he was like, oh, I really love this thing. Like, this is really great. This feels like the show. And so I cut down my two and a half minute piece to a one and a half minute piece and Then he started, um, you know, he took the music, brought it to uh, Oliver Lata, the brilliant um, animator who who designed the main titles, and and he animated to the music. Great, and I think the main title or this theme is the core of the show and the core yes. of of the entire score. I think it's incredibly difficult to find the core of a movie or of a series by writing a two minute piece of music? I mean, you know, one of the things that uh, interested me about this, about this approach was that, it, you know, it was founded on this chord progression that, that really felt, um, first of all, it, it, it felt right for the show. And it also felt like it wants to cycle indefinitely. And so then, then the thought is, okay, well, how can I just sort of keep pulling this idea apart and, um, 
and let it evolve so that it it mirrors the idea of of uh unraveling this mystery of 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 the world of of lumen the world of the show um and you know and i was really pleased that you know i i think that we were able to keep letting the music evolve so that it didn't run out of juice and now i've got to figure out how to do that for a second season okay great and theodore now i would like to talk about um, your collaboration with director paul feig he directed the school for good and evil and before mm -hmm. we talk about that project i would like to just at least discuss ghostbusters for let's say a minute or two yeah. because i've always been a big um fan of the ghostbusters movies i grew up watching them you know the first one was released in 1984 and then 89 the second one came along yeah. and then in 2016 the reboot was released yeah. directed by paul feig um sadly it was met with criticism before it was even released i've rewatched the film just a few days ago and i really must say it's a really 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 good score and thank you could you um express how much the ghostbusters franchise means to you and how it all came to to fruition for you personally yeah well so i mean i love the original ghostbusters it was uh, you know i i was probably um you know i was in my early teens when i when that was in the theaters and it, you know i just remember it being so funny and um you know funny and scary and and just a, a, a great concoction of a movie and also that that um you know just the chemistry of bill murray and dan Aykroyd and harold ramis at that particular moment in time you know bill murray was just magic on screen at that at that moment and it, you, they just captured something very very special um that is really hard to reproduce um you know j just great chemistry and um and i think that you know i think that that's really what uh paul was was going for is is just finding some really funny actors and letting their chemistry carry the film and and um you know so so that that i thought was the right you know i i, I really admired that approach i think that that's true to the spirit of the original film um and you know musically musically we really wanted um to just to go our own direction. I mean, I, I love the Elmer score, um, but but this felt like it was going to be a different enough tone, this movie, that that we were going to go our own direction. And 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 so we did. Um, you know, it's funny. Like, I feel like I have learned a lot and seen a lot in the intervening years about fan service. And... Um, you know, probably if I, or if I knew then what I know now, I maybe I would have felt more pressure to um, to use the Elmer material or to or elements of the Elmer material, um, because uh, you know, because clearly I think that there are a lot of of fans who really want to. Um, see the ideas from the original um films be you know be recycled not in a negative way but 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 brought back to life um and uh but that wasn't what paul was doing you know paul was was creating his own new world and and so that's what we did musically great and the school for good and evil if I'm not mistaken, is your fifth collaboration with Paul Feig. Yeah, that's right. I reckon that if you have established that kind of trust, I think that a director may bring you on really early. Let's say in, yeah. in pre-production stage, for instance. Uh, did, did, right. did, did this happen on the School for Good and Evil? Yes. Um, I mean, this is something that I like to do in general. I like to start as early as possible. Um, because uh, I, f 
find that it presents the best opportunity to do something new, to not be influenced by temp score. Um, and, you know, just to get on the same page with the director and, and respond to story and character rather than just sitting in front of the picture and reacting to it. Um, so I wrote a bunch of the, of the key thematic material before they started shooting. Uh, some of that was because there was on camera, um, there was on camera music that needed to be written. Some of the waltzes, for example, contain the, um, you know, contain the themes for the main characters of Sophie and Agatha. And, but, but we also developed themes for the school for good themes for the school for, uh, and the school for evil. Um, the material for the song, Who Do You Think You Are, which ultimately also ended up playing a big role um, in the film itself. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, 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 and a bunch of other material that, 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 that was uh, instrumental to the score. So it, it was a great and fruitful period where we, we got a lot of thematic material written. What may this film have offered to you that others did not? I mean, you know, I don't get that many opportunities to um, to work with such a huge canvas as this. You know, this, this is really um, creating a new world. And um, I don't think anything that else that I've worked on, unless I'm forgetting something, is is really quite the same, the same thing. So, um, so this just felt like this this opportunity to do something really unique and epic, and um, you know, in the case of this film, um, you know, because the heroes and villains um, that are referenced in the film really like span the ages, it it offered up this fun opportunity to have a score that referred to a bunch of different musical eras um, and and felt like it had that kind of like timeless uh, sweep to it. Um, you know, so so there are these sort of medieval folk music uh, uh, influences of like recorders and frame drums and then harpsichords, which is, you know, more of a Baroque idea and, you know, on and on through sort of modern, modern beats and, and production. So um, it was really like this f opportunity to create this stew of, uh, a, a, of different ingredients from different eras. I know that some actors have said in the past that, you know, playing the villain or playing darker parts is more fun than playing the good guy all the time. And would you agree with that sentiment from a musical standpoint? <laughs> yeah, well, the the um, the school for evil definitely had had really fun um, elements to it. You know, in particular, um, we used this ethnic Bulgarian choir um, a lot with for, for for the school for evil, and it's this great kind of harsh nasal um all female vocal sound and um so yeah no the 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 the, the bad guys get the fun toys i think is is the take home from that <laughs> great and i think it's maybe or it could be overwhelming to tackle a project of this size and of this magnitude because it offers so many great effects and just the scope of the whole thing and yeah. what's your focal point or what was your focal point on this film interesting i mean uh, you know the focal point is always just um story i mean it, it really is that it's just keeping your eye on on the storytelling and and um And then also keeping an eye on momentum and making sure that you're supporting the narrative drive of the story as much as possible. Um, that that's really th those are the things. You know, if if I'm in the middle of working on a film and I get to sit and watch the whole thing in in progress, um, those are the things that I'm really looking for. Is am I am I helping the audience? um 
see what the big signposts are story wise and um and emphasizing those those key points in the film and am i sort of keeping the energy moving appropriately yeah and i think a movie of this kind is not necessarily straightforward i mean it offers you a musical palette or canvas also let's say a dichotomy if you will yeah um absolutely i mean the, the, this is um you know i think that the interesting thing about about what the story is doing is that it's presenting this dichotomy um between good and evil and then it's and then it's undermining it so um you know if, as we all know people are are very rarely either all good or all bad and um and i think that the that the story and and the movie has fun with with uh you know setting setting up that dichotomy and then and then exploding it all right and one must also point out and i think you mentioned it earlier on that you combine many different elements i mean it, it has a big orchestral score but it also contains some baroque elements for for, for yeah. instance so it's a a multifaceted score and approach yeah i mean and and you know i really love um you know, I really love combining disparate elements into a score. I mean, I think it's one of the it's one of the really great things that you can do in film um, that makes it that makes it a, a, a very inviting medium to, to work in is, you know, throw together things that shouldn't make sense and try to make sense out of it. And and so this this was a really great chance to, um, like I said, to 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 throw a bunch of different ingredients into the pot and and make something new out of it. Theodore, thank you so much for taking thank so much you. time. Thank you. Really, yes. I had a great time talking to you and I hope you enjoyed the conversation as well. I really did. Thank you so much. <laughs>